My name is Gary LeBlanc and uh, I've worked on a, a bridge that's called the Confederation Bridge, a span that goes between uh, New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. And I've worked there in uh, 96 and 97. And it's a 13 kilometer bridge, has uh, 21 approaches and 44 piers. It was a bridge building project, which is major infrastructure uh, of a value of $1.2 billion. So it was considered industrial work for the size of the project itself. It wasn't like a regular standard refinery or paper mill, but it still had a lot of electrical equipment, transformers, transfer switches through the whole uh, bridge itself. They had uh, four different weather stations on the bridge itself because literally this is the only place in Canada that the speed limit can change from 100 kilometers an hour to 10 kilometers an hour legally in a span of 13 kilometers and legally the speed limit can change 44 times. The safety itself, uh, when you got hired on as a new hire, you had a three hours orientation, which uh, they kind of explained some of the hazards because it was a different scope of a job. And it also covered uh, fall protection through uh, uh, this orientation. And they also mentioned that you had to have a flotation suit because this bridge was above a big body of water which if something should have happened that you would stay afloat and be visible for a rescue. Their, um, part of their orientation, uh, they, it was mentioned to all new hires that it was a, a massive project, one of a kind in the world, a lot of different hazards in a standard industrial construction site. Their expectation was to not have any more than 13 fatalities on the project. Every morning we started the shift with, uh, back then it was called a tailgate meeting. So we had to make sure that everybody was able to communicate appropriately to all their supervisors. Uh, you have to understand that the scope of work, how the people got to work, different spans which were not connected at the time so you had 44 individual piers that had no connection to one another so workers had to be brought in either by helicopter if they were working on the deck or they were brought in by a boat to the pier base and then they would have to climb a ladder up to the the, the opening in order to get into the pier to crew to uh, go to their task so communication was a major factor. So every morning we had to make sure that all radios worked properly. I was site superintendent. We were 60 people working on the, on the project. I had uh, two GFs and six foremen. So one GF called me in and uh, said that one of his foremen had brought his attention that he had a, um, a new worker apprentice which uh, was not listening appropriately to all his directions he was going at locations where he was not supposed to be at there are certain spots on the bridge that was not ready for us to go work at so we had to skip them so um, at that time we had a meeting it was sorry it was the end of the day so we set up a meeting for the next day the supervisor itself the GF and myself to discuss what we were going to be doing with this new employee. So the next morning when we had our meeting, we discussed what we were going to do and we had decided to put this new worker in the tool crib for approximately two weeks where it would give us a chance to go talk to him every day, to calm him down, to show him and to tell him how the scope of the work is uh, operating on an industrial site. Try to educate him so that he doesn't have to run to every task that he's doing. Sometimes 
The carpenter have to go in front of us to create walkways for us to go between certain span. There's a there's a an expansion joint that's called a drop-in span and that's what connects all the piers together. So once that is done, the carpenters have to go in and create walkways for us to go walk from one pier to the next. If they're not done, then we cannot go work on those piers. We have, this is the concern of the foreman is that our new worker was crossing those barriers. He was making himself some makeshift uh, apparatuses in order to get to the next span where he was not allowed to go to work at the time. He was uh, not complying with all our safety rules at the time. He was taking a lot of chances. Uh, he, for some odd reason, didn't appear to be fully aware of all the hazards that he was putting himself into and by not listening to his foreman. And the method of, of the way that he chose to do his work was not at the utmost safest way. The same morning that he went back to his regular crew, the supervisor uh, called in the GF stating the same complaint that he was in a pier where he wasn't supposed to be. He was caught first thing in the morning going across uh, a span that he was, or uh, sorry, a pier that he was not allowed to go work to. So it was brought back to our attention and they came, they called me up and we had a second meeting. At this meeting, it was brought to my attention that this new worker was not complying and he was doing the same things that he were doing before we disciplined him and put him the two weeks in the tool crib, but it appeared to have escalated. So we had decided that we were gonna bring him in and we were gonna suspend him for two weeks with pay. And then when we brought him back in, we were gonna give him another orientation and we were gonna sit down with him and explain again the hazards of this job site and he had to take his time to do his task safely and to always be in communication with his supervisor. At that time while we were having the meeting, then I got a call that there was a, an incident on Pier 38 and it was a potential fatal incident. When I got the call, it felt like it wasn't real. It, you feel like your body's, you're, you're outside your body. Then you have to rush there and you have to find out if it's what you think is true, is really true. So we all jumped in the truck and we drove to Pier uh, 39. So we've crossed over when we got there, it was apparent that uh, he had put a, a ladder across the span where he was not allowed to go work. He was working off a 60 foot scaffolding and he had brought in with him a second 24 foot ladder to work on underneath the top deck where the footing of the ladder had slipped on the scaffolding where he had plunged down 80 to 90 feet to, uh, to concrete. The scene itself was frozen. Then the emergency crew itself went uh, down the pier base itself and uh, collected the body then brought him out. When, he, when they brought him out, like it was very it was apparent for us even before the rescue people got there that this kid was not going to survive. So at this time we were all on the top deck of the, the, the pier itself where the, the, the chopper airlifted him to mainland and then an ambulance took him and we followed the ambulance down to the hospital.
while we were waiting for the rescue to, to be completed, I phoned the head office and uh, the head office was in Newfoundland. So I told the owners that uh, we've had a serious high potential of a fatal incident on the bridge and uh, that we were going to bring the kid to the hospital. So at that moment, they asked me if uh, I would follow the ambulance to the hospital to find out the result for sure. And at the same time, called their parent, uh, called the worker's parent to, to meet us at the hospital. I got, I was there and approximately 10 minutes after we had got to the hospital, the, the, the doctor declared the worker uh, deceased. So I waited at the hospital till the parents got there and uh, like anybody else, the parents were in shock and they were very distressed and there was a lot of crying and a lot of high emotions at the hospital itself. When we got back to work, <clears throat> OHNS has stopped the work, which is absolutely a normal procedure. We took all the workers and uh, we briefed them on what had happened, the status of, of the, the scope of the work and the hazards that were involved in complying with all the safety of the job site itself. Try to keep all the workers informed and as to everything that had happened. So this way here, there was no doubts or or bad feelings. As soon as uh, after they froze the scene, uh, they confiscated my journal. That was part one. They we were interviewed for six hours. Myself, the. Uh, GF and the supervisor in question. They confiscated my, my journal, uh, the GF journal and the supervisors. They photocopied the whole journal completely. That was part of their record that they wanted to, to have. Plus, uh, part of their investigation was everything that had happened to this worker for the last seven days because at that time we were working seven days a week. So they wanted to understand what had happened and how did it come about that this worker went to this point the way he did. We, uh, that evening we went to uh, the funeral home and when we got there, <clears throat> uh, the worker's mother came out, meted us at, at uh, the front door and was just screaming at us that we had killed her kid. And at that point, the, the GF looked at me and he says, let's get the hell out of here. I just cannot take this. So we turned around and we didn't go to the service. That was it for us at that moment. So after the funeral, the next day we, uh, we had a, a safety stand up. First of all, we had, okay, we did have a safety stand down. We, just to, to, to keep everybody in the loop, uh, information so that uh, there was, uh, trying to put every worker there at ease. Um, Give them the scope of how important it was to, to always maintain uh, safe work ethics. And, uh, it was more like a debriefing session than anything else. Trying to appease everybody that was there and in order to make them realize that they need to work safely in order to go home at night. Not on this, uh, it was not part of uh, any insurance group that we had or any part of the project uh, specialty. Nobody, no, that was not offered to us.
Every three days I had to meet with the owners and uh, I had to tell them what I was going to be doing for the next three days. And every morning when I went up to work, there was a radio station that was uh, broadcasting the weather forecast. So not by being smart, I would just always copy down what they were saying. And unless the conditions of the weather itself changed that day, I wouldn't adjust my notes to that. I would just leave it to whatever uh, they had said on the radio that, that day. So three days later, when I get to the meeting and I have to explain why something wasn't done that I told them that I would do, the, the, the question was always, why have you not got this done? So then I would be able to pull my journal and say, well, uh, it was raining with uh, excessive winds of uh, over 100 kilometers an hour. We had to take the people off the top deck. So those tasks were not, uh, it, we were not able to complete those tasks. So I was able to justify why, uh, not knowing that it was going to become a focal point in my journal when we got to court. I would always write everything that happened, every conversation that I had that pertained to the job, whether it was material delivery, if it was returning material, if it was um, anything that was a safety issue on the job site itself, I would log it in. Uh, the foreman's, I would write uh, the spots on the location of the project where every supervisors had their crews every day. So this way here, I could track where people were working all the time. After the funeral, the stand down, and we kept working for approximately two months when the RCMP showed up at the main gate. Then I had a summons that we had to appear in court and also my journal was summons also. I had to bring my journal in with me. So once we went into and, at, and, and to court for the, the preliminary hearing, the judge ordered me and the journal in his chamber. Then he grabbed my journal and he's trying to locate if I am telling the truth or not. So he turns around and that was the only landmark that was on my journal that was consistent every day. So he phoned in the, the Weather Bureau and said, uh, this radio station, CKCW, says every morning, I want you to verify for me, please, if this day, what does it say? So he picked in the vicinity of 20 to 25 days, dipped randomly through my journal, and after everything was said, I had kept an accurate weather point on my journal. So the judge agreed that he would consider that my journal was to be true. We had also, I had also logged the meetings that I had had with the GF and the foreman about the worker in question and the content of why we were having this meeting. So the judge took that uh, I was telling the truth. He also had interviews with, uh, with all six supervisors and asked a bunch of questions of stuff that I had wrote, written into the journal itself. He did verify like a lot of points to see if I was writing the truth in to the journal because he was he had to make a decision whether I had written the truth or not. So there was a lot of points that were uh, the interviews with the with the work with sorry with the supervisors as where they were working certain days and whatever the the supervisor had written in their own journals did match what I was writing in mine. So the judge did look for a lot of points on the journal itself to make sure that it was that I was writing the truth. It's the scariest thing you can ever go through in life when one man will decide your fate, whether he's going to accept that you've honestly didn't do anything wrong or he doesn't accept it and gives you a punishment for it.
three days of the court, three days in a row, I didn't sleep at all. Don't ever, ever take a shortcut when it comes to safety. You never know when it has the potential of biting you. Keep your journal always true. It can become your very best friend. Again, don't ever, ever take shortcuts when it comes to safety. If you have an at-risk behavior employer, employee, keep an extreme close eye on this individual until you can regulate the problem. If the individual needs to be removed from his environment, then remove him. As much as possible, go back to the field, observe your worker make sure that he is working safely. A supervisor intervening with their worker, always be aware of the workers that you have and how they're working. You have to intervene. You have to keep your workers safe. You have to make sure they understand that they need to work safely. Well, back then we uh, we didn't have like extended. Um, some companies call them FLRA. Some call some company calls them a hard card, where a worker stops and really uh, identify the hazards of his work task at location where he's at uh, it was not done at the time it was more like a tailgate uh, meeting that was in the morning and literally it was guys sitting on the tailgate of their truck discussing the scope of their work whereas today the worker stops and go through an FLRA or a hard card or a start card that would identify even to this young worker the hazards that he was exposing himself to. Other equipment that we have is a better training program. Whereas we did not have training programs. Supervisors training did not exist. We did not have this. It was word of mouth from different people that knew you and said, this guy will be a foreman. This guy will be a supervisor. This guy will be a, gen a general foreman. This guy will be a superintendent. Equipment itself, we have better equipment today than we had at the time of that job itself. Where we are being trained to use the equipment. We have fall protection training programs now, whereas it was part of the orientation and it was a light blurb at orientation when they were talking about fall protection. Whereas today we have like full training programs for them. There's the supervisor's training, where again, we did not have that at the, at the time. Anything that's important through the day, log some notes, because your memory will not serve you that well in a year, or let's say six months, in time if you need to track a certain worker uh, if you only put a couple of notes it might make sense to you that day but make clear notes so this way here in six months time you can still go back to it and absolutely read either certain behaviors or certain aspect of why you were writing those notes you will understand them again At today's standard, now that we have on top of everything else, we have Bill C-45 that holds everybody accountable from the supervisor up to the company owners. It is even more important today to protect yourself, 
with a good journal and also every time you go out in the field make sure that your your workers are competent and that they are working safely the primary role of a supervisor today he is their biggest mentor they will follow by example so if he complies himself to all the rules and regulations and the safety aspect, they will also follow the safety rules. It is important for him to show leadership by following them himself. So therefore, one of his worker cannot say, well, you're not following these rules, why should I? We did try to keep the highest end of safety that we possibly could under the scope of work that we had. The safety itself was said at the time to be over excellent because you have to understand they had budgeted for 13 deaths and they finished the project with only three deaths. I was there for the opening of the bridge. Huge ceremonies, um, massive speech of how well the project had gone, the safety record that they were able to pull out, and um, major, major ceremonies, like millions of dollars worth of fanciness to create a celebration. They did not land at home for me. I still had one death, which was way too much. The supervisor, the more involved they are with their workers, the much better result that that foreman's going to get out of his workers. The workers are happy, they are more productive, they feel better about themselves. absolutely supervisor he's the one initially responsible for them the co-workers himself they can definitely help their co-workers along um, they did have mentoring program but that is not to specific group pep talks and a good tap on the shoulder belongs to everybody not just the foreman's Please listen to your supervisors. Listen and follow the rules. You will go home safely every night if you do so. Pay a lot of attention to your new worker until you're comfortable that he's doing everything right. 